humanity has opened the gates of hell. We're heading towards a 2.8 degree temperature rise. And that means a dangerous and unstable world. These are the words of the UN Secretary General Guterres just a few days back in New York. And uh, if you want to have a glimpse of what the dangerous world and unstable is, well, we need to just look at the past weeks of extreme weather events from uh, uh, heat waves, floods, droughts, wildfires, you name it. And that is true for developed and developing countries. In the US in 2023, this year, which is not finished yet, is a record year for extreme weather events. 23 only, and is counting. And that has an impact, has an impact on the economy, on the financial sector. Just take the case of Florida, where the risk premiums are going higher and higher. Insurers are leaving uh, certain areas of Florida. And that has, a, has an impact on the home insurance crisis, ultimately on the taxpayers, on all of us. Yet, Climate security, in the words of Mission Climate Ready, has not the same attention. Climate security intended as getting ready to live through these extreme events and recover quickly. Has not the same attention as energy or food security. Nor as the focus of the investors, which are focusing on mitigation issues on the climate agenda. So, to understand why and what is needed uh, and the role of the financial sector, it's my pleasure to have uh, today here Emma Howard Boyd, chair of the Green Finance Institute with us. Um, Emma has been chair of the environmental agencies as well as a long experience in the asset management and financial industry and has been behind Mission Climate Ready to name just one of the many initiatives in this space. My name is Raffaele Della Croce. I'm a lead uh, adaptation research uh, analyst at the center, and I'm also co-director of the Singapore Green Finance Center. So, Emma, welcome. How are you, first of all? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really pleased to be here. I'm one of, uh, um, I think, quite a number of people who were out in uh, New York Climate Week and picked up COVID, but really pleased that I am out the other side, if slightly brain fogged. So forgive me if I get confused or blurry in what I'm saying, but I'm um, really pleased to be here today because we don't shine a big enough spotlight on the adaptation and resilience agenda. I think that is changing but uh, really pleased to see how the, the center's work in particular is focusing on this really important issue. So thank you. Thank you. And we will have more on the center, on the Imperial College, more broadly uh, working on physical risk uh, and adaptation financing. Uh, during this uh, conversation with you, uh, the, in the session is gonna be just after this conversation, uh, there is a panel session on physical climate risk this afternoon. There is plenty going uh, on this agenda, and the center is definitely committed to that. Um, and of course, this is gaining attention also in the UK with the National Adaptation Plan this summer, the London Climate Review, so we will go into that. But first, plenty of topics uh, trying to cover with you. We'll see what, uh, what we manage uh, to do in, uh, in our time. We'll uh, have time for Q&A uh, towards the end of this uh, uh, slot. So be ready, but let's start with the current state of play of financing climate adaptation. Uh, where do we currently stand uh, at the international level on adaptation resilience and the, in the UK as well? What's your view? So I think before we go into the detail of uh, the financing and where we are there, I think it is really important to pause on what, how you, where you started mm -hmm. in terms of the almost daily, if not several times a day, news that we are now hearing about climate shocks around the world. And my background is in finance. I've spent most of my career working in, initially in corporate finance, then in asset management. 
were always in asset management on the green finance agenda. And about 10 years ago, I moved into a portfolio career, went on the board of the Environment Agency. And I think it was then, and only then, chairing the organization that for England is responsible for environmental regulation, but also delivery for flood and coastal erosion risk management. It also has a pension fund, the Environment Agency Pension Fund, now part of the Brunel Pensions Partnership, which was one of the reasons why I put myself forward in the first place to join the board and ultimately ended up um, chairing the organization. But for me, it was getting out into the field, getting out and meeting colleagues who are also beneficiaries of the Environment Agency Pension Fund and understanding how their daily roles were changing because of climate change. Whether it was either in the delivery of the flood and coastal erosion risk management, putting schemes into place, or indeed how they were regulating for a vast range of different environmental um, issues climate change was making a difference. And I think that very much grounded me as someone cut their teeth in the world of finance in the real economy. And I think that is where um, centers like yours really need to make sure that they're focusing not just on finance, but where finance meets real stuff happening in the real world. Financing and the, the most recent report that came out, I think, earlier this week, which uh, is the Resilience Evidence Forum's report, synthesis report, says that roughly $50 billion a year is aimed towards resiliency. And I haven't gone into the, the definitions of resiliency adaptation, but I, I'm seeing this in all... Uh, as, as a sum of all of the finance helping to get communities, cities, countries ready for climate shocks. But that is still a fraction of the 160 billion to 340 billion that this report sets out, which is needed on an annual basis to get the world ready for climate shocks. And the other figure that I remember from this report is that roughly 2% of that money comes from the private sector. So given the scale of the challenge, given that it's my view and a, a number of other people working in this space's view that our net zero investments are now at huge risk if we don't make sure that they are ready to operate in whatever the weather is thrown at them, whether it is floods, sea level rise, extreme heat, uh, all the things that we're now seeing in the storms, the cyclones, whatever they're called around the world, then we are massively missing a trick. And indeed, we may even be right now investing in infrastructure that is not taking that um, forward look into account and that could be the infrastructure that becomes stranded in the future because it's no longer fit for purpose given what we know is locked in in terms of climate change. Everything that we have experienced this year is at 1.1 degrees warming. Um, the, the, the scientists saying that we've touched this year on 1.5, but the average, rolling average is 1.1. We know that we are um, heading towards 2.8. Yes, there are some reports which enthusiastically put it at um, a much lower temperature. But regardless, what we've got locked in, even if we manage to stick to 1.5 to keep that alive, we are going to continue to see extreme weather impact lives, livelihoods, and the very investments that we are making today to help us get to net zero. So climate action is needed, is needed now, and financing needs to be scaled up. Absolutely. From your mission climate analysis on the adaptation finance ecosystem in the UK, you, you follow the core issue is not finance per se, but a lack of targeted policy, what you call in the, in the report the vision, the leadership. Uh, that needs to start from, from, from the government side. 
What are the implications of recent political setbacks on the green agenda in the UK and internationally that we see more and more coming, with, and with elections also coming in the next months? How do you value the recent, the recent national adaptation plan and the green finance strategy in, uh, in this vein? So I think uh, plenty has been said about uh, the recent changes, um, rowing back on policies in the UK. What that does say to me is what I've just said about adaptation and resilience becomes even more urgent. Uh, unfortunately, when you see countries rowing back on their net zero commitments, um, not providing that certainty that we know is so important for businesses and investors to invest against, um, where it gives potentially permission for other countries to also row back on their policies or put it into the political debate as elections start happening. I, again, that emphasises to me how urgent it is to make sure that we understand what it is we will be experiencing from a changing climate. I think we see positive steps forward uh, in terms of indication for more work on adaptation and resilience in the green finance strategy. I was really pleased to see that there you will get um, the different agencies and regulatory bodies work together <laughs> on adaptation. And this is something that I called for um, quite extensively when I was chair of the Environment Agency because it was clear to me that we weren't making sure that environmental policy was in line with the economic policy, so the economic regulation re regulators in the UK like Ofwat, Ofgen, and indeed financial regulators. So great to see that that ambition to get regulators of the real economy and finance and e economics working more closely together. But I think uh, still that lack of urgency at the speed at which we need to start making these changes. So again, whilst it was important to see the National Adaptation Programme being um, published earlier this year, it still, in my mind, lacked the urgency we need. And a lot of what it was calling for was setting out things that needed to be looked at, discussed over the years to come, as opposed to um, moving swiftly forward on some of the things that um, we've discussed. You mentioned uh, uh, that finance needs to meet the real economy. And uh, I can't think of cities as, as the better place where this come together. Um, so, and look also, looking also at the role of cities in driving the financing agenda, the, the urbanization trend, the 70% of the global population which will live in cities by 2050. Uh, the business opportunities potentially there, uh, some estimates give 3.7 trillion annually for the private sector by 2030. But at the same time, we see property values which are not necessarily related to carbon footprint or energy efficiency improvements. Where did, does this funding will come from for building these resilient cities? And where do you see opportunities for investors now or in the future? And I think this is where we do need to work alongside our colleagues looking at other forms of climate finance. If you're going, for example, through retrofit, which has been a theme of um, work that the Green Finance Institute is, is leading on, um, working on in collaboration with others, not just in the UK, but in Spain and in Copenhagen. If you're going to go through the disruption of a refurbishment, you need to be thinking as well, what other things do you do, whether it's commercial property or indeed residential property, to make sure that that property is ready for 
um, the shocks that we are uh, and the, the experiences we know that we're going to um, see. So whether it's water scarcity, working on water efficiency within the built environment, whether it is extreme heat, uh, ma making sure that those investments are fit for purpose. That is where uh, the Green Finance Institute with others is looking sector by sector at what the most relevant financial product, financial invention, uh, intervention is to make sure that money flows. And I think this is where the sectoral approach, setting out those um, transition finance plans, but where relevant, making sure that there is an adaptation a pathway planned for those investments is, is something that we need to see. Now, um, we also need to make sure that when we're looking at adaptation and resilience, we're not just looking at uh, an asset in isolation. I talked to Network Rail after the extreme heat that we experienced in London last year. And I don't know if um, those of you that were in London remember that vast amounts of the railway network shut down. Now, this was in two days at 40 degrees centigrade, although we had um, uh, higher than um, average temperature levels either side. Uh, there you've got a city um, with railway lines going out in different directions. So even if a city is setting a standard, a resilience standard, it needs to make sure that it fits within the infrastructure that is traveling around a country. But when I talk to Network Rail, uh, they also recognize that in the past, where they have had to deal with work on the railway network after a flood, the response was often to look at what they needed to do to their asset um, to make sure that the electronics were above um, flood level and make sure that that was resilient to future flood events. With the benefit of hindsight, and this was in the, the, the case study they, they mentioned to me was Carlisle, which flooded over 10 years ago, was had they sat down with all of the others um, infrastructure providers in that city and thought about how you make that city resilient, you'd have probably come up with a different plan and spent money, uh, a smaller amount of money to, to potentially deliver an even more efficient resiliency to, to that city. And these are the different ways that we need to work to make sure at the city level we are thinking not just about a building, a bit of infrastructure being splendidly resilient, but how the whole ecosystem of a city works um, through those shocks that could happen not just for a few days, but for, for, for several days. And that, I suppose, is the philosophy behind the London Climate Review, which was launched just before the summer you're chairing. That is the spirit also of this review that uh, uh, conducting, you're conducting on London. Yeah, so I, I was asked um, back in June by the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to undertake a, a quick review. So it, uh, the intention is to have it finished by the, the end of this year. Uh, to see how ready London is for climate shocks and make recommendations. So how, how to keep London going, moving, livable, no matter what weather is thrown at it. And uh, this is, uh, we're about halfway through. It's a massive project, but actually having a timeline means that we have to be quite um, concise in terms of what we do. And the report will make recommendations to the mayor, but it will also make recommendations to national government, regional government, and look at how, again, London as a whole needs to work on this important agenda and a get ahead of climate change as opposed to doing a review post-event. Um, this, this is where we do have the opportunity to look at how we get ready uh, if, for, for me, uh, a, a, a night that was um, 
quite important from understanding what this means was the midway through COP26. It was a Sunday evening. It was the eve of adaptation day at COP26. And during the past 24 hours, the previous 24 hours, we had three barriers, the Thames barrier, the Hull barrier, and the Boston barrier um, up protecting those cities quietly from the flood risk that was playing out because of the weather system that was going across the, the, the country. That is great resilience. Um, with the Thames barrier, we have a, a, a program, uh, a, it's a well-known um, amongst the adaptation world, the Thames Estuary 2100 plan, which sets out very clearly what needs to be done from a tidal flooding perspective to keep London protected from sea level rise. Uh, back in May, May, May this year, uh, there was a 10-year review of the plan, and what it showed was that although the date for building a second or new Thames barrier remains roughly the same, 2070, all of the flood defences, the London side, so this side of the Thames barrier, need to be raised by 2050. The, the cost that's been associated with that is over £16 billion, pounds. And it needs to be worked on from now until 2050 to make sure that it is ready. This is a vast stretch, kilometres of flood defences that need to be raised. And the defences will only be as good as the weakest link. So there is no room for complacency that it has to be ready for the sea level rise then. And this is where we need to look at new, given constraints in terms of public funding, is there a way of bringing in private sector finance to enable those sorts of projects to happen in a timely fashion? Which is the topic of the panel we're going to go into in a minute. Uh, you mentioned the COP. Um, ahead of the COP28 in Dubai, what are your expectations coming out from the New York Climate Week, you told us, uh, for adaptation and resilience initiatives? Uh, what is on the agenda there? What, your expectation? I seriously hope that adaptation and resilience, and particularly the financing of it, gets even greater attention at the next COP. It's really important wherever you are in the world, but I think the fact that these events have been playing out every, everywhere has meant that attention has changed, and that is certainly um, my uh, response to what I saw and heard at New York Climate Week, that um, the, the focus on adaptation and resilience has begun to shift. It's probably still not where it needs to be, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I think uh, there is greater understanding between where this has traditionally been seen as something that happens somewhere else, in the global south, uh, that this is now a whole world issue and is has multiple impacts. Again, uh, it's not just the uh, it's the health impacts associated with, in particular, in extreme heat and fires, and this is affecting everybody. And we need some new thinking about um, adaptation resilience as an as an asset class, and that nature is a key ingredient to delivering on this too, as indeed nature is a key ingredient for delivering on some of our net zero strategies. So bringing this all together uh, is, a, is a great way of us creating um, net zero plans, but also adaptation investment strategies with nature where relevant absolutely at its heart. And again, if we just look very briefly at London, where we have also experienced surface water flooding at an increasing rate, um, this is where lives and livelihoods could be lost because water goes into 
basements, and we've certainly seen a number of basements being flooded um, in London in recent years. Some of the solutions to holding that water in London are the rain gardens that we're now seeing in certain boroughs. And those are exactly the sorts of uh, interventions that bring multiple benefits. They bring green, they, bring, they can bring trees, they can bring shade, um, which is very relevant to extreme heat, but they can also hold water and stop flooding and um, help with the impacts and help with some of those, uh, get ahead of the what will otherwise be insurance losses as people make claims because their homes, their businesses have been flooded. Great. Uh, plenty of nature on Nature Today during the, the conference. Uh, we're going to get into the panel as well. Uh, we've been discussing uh, uh, health impact uh, due to climate events. Uh, and Imperial clearly is the place where this kind of research uh, uh, um, should be done. Um, one last question before getting the panel and then probably open to the Q&A at the end of the panel because then see that we're running uh, out of time. Knowing Imperial and, and the wide spectrum of uh, research uh, and this gap between uh, climate action and acad academic research, what is the role for, for Imperial College University for the center, you think, uh, addressing this type of gap, what, what is needed? What do you see as? Uh... So I, I really um, enjoyed reading your report on Singapore. I'm really looking forward to the same research that you're doing for London. I'm hoping that's going to help me with some of the recommendations I will be making to the mayor. I also think uh, where academia has helped with climate change has been the quick attribution analysis that has been made a linking a climate event to climate change. What I really want to see, particularly those ac academics working on finance and the economy, is the same attribution analysis showing the impact on the uh, economy. I think that will help win more of the arguments as to why action is needed, but too often that research, as indeed it happened with um, climate change attribution, came months after the event and people have moved on in terms of their thinking. When there is a strike in this country, a, a train strike, there are figures associating that with the destruction to the economy. We should be able to get cleverer, cleverer and more speedy in terms of showing how the sorts of events that we are experiencing impact the economy and then at the same time how the interventions that we know are possible need time to um, implement, although some of this is pretty easy and could be done at pace, that's where um, research can help. I also think the work that um, the Green Finance Institute has done with academics and others on building project pipelines is essential too. And uh, again, uh, looking at the structures of finance, so your report on municipal bonds, we've got abundance here in the audience too, who's done some fantastic um, small municipal bonds here in the UK. We need to be innovating at pace and then scaling and spreading those investments around the country. And I think this is where academia can be uh, a real help, particularly where you are um, working collaboratively with other institutions, but also in place. So know the sorts of things that make, will make a real difference in um, the cities that you're located. I was unable, because I was still um, uh, looking, uh, staying housebound because of COVID, unable to meet, uh, uh, join a meeting that my review team organized with all of the cultural and academic and other organizations here on Exhibition Road who are looking at um, net zero and resilience as a, as a community. And it's those sorts of programs that really help make the work that we need to do become live and real and hopefully move into being implemented and delivered. Thank you very much, Emma. Those are definitely collaboration uh, uh, research leveraging uh, uh, 
the different parts of Imperial. That's that's uh, uh, um, our research on financial uh, um, institutions in London internationally. That's what we do. So with this, I say uh, we conclude this first part of the conversation with Emma. And thank you. Uh, let me join me. I would ask two panelists uh, of the next panel on adaptation resilient financing to join us. Welcome uh, Paul. Uh, Paul Monday is Director for Global Climate Adaptation Resilient Specialist uh, S&P Global Ratings. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Barney. Barney Dobson, Research Fellow at Imperial College London, uh, to join us in the panel. Unfortunately, Andy Deacon, co-managing director of the Global Government of Majors for Climate and Energy, uh, is not going to make it. Uh, uh, but we do have uh, plenty here to, to discuss uh, and plenty of expertise on the panel. Uh, so just a few slides to introduce uh, the topic uh, and uh, uh, set the scene. Uh, we discuss a bit of uh, Imperial College research and adaptation resilience, there are different strands of work relevant for this discussion. Uh, we've been participating to uh, consultations such as the uh, London Climate Resilience Review, the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee on the inquiry on the heat resilience and sustainable cooling through different strands of work. Uh, here you have uh, uh, some of them, uh, so for example, the work on nature base, uh, blue and green infrastructure, looking at heat waves uh, in, uh, at the urban level, the water systems that Barney is going to talk about, uh, uh, there is a research on uh, prolonged droughts and increased surface runoff uh, on the material themselves. Uh, there is work uh, on wildfires, environmental, uh, environmental society by Professor Prentice. Uh, as well, uh, plus the grand term. Uh, today in the afternoon we will have more on, on uh, extreme weather events, uh, impact and financing aspects. So you mentioned the work that the center has been doing on adaptation bonds. Uh, uh, we've been looking at the um, Singapore and we are currently looking at the situation uh, in, in London, the UK more generally on adaptation financing. On the next slide. Uh, just uh, to introduce this work, uh, with this paper which is forthcoming, uh, we've been looking at an investor survey to get uh, uh, the feedback from uh, the actors, stakeholders, uh, but also the potential investors, uh, the ones which are investing or are potentially going to invest in adaptation, uh, what are the main issues and, and the opportunities there or the lack of opportunities, better said, uh, at the moment. And the case studies uh, of uh, what is already happening and could be scaled up, uh, and the reason why this is not happening at the moment. So this includes uh, developments in the UK, as discussed with Emma, but also the concept, context in the international agenda. And here we leverage very much our Singapore Green Finance Center, for which uh, uh, we are co-managing with Singapore Management University in, in Singapore, the activity. Uh, looking at the same agenda with an Asian uh, focus, uh, uh, and uh, this paper on Singapore and adaptation financing in Singapore was related to the center leveraging the expertise uh, 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 there. So uh, we got, we're looking at the, the, the new financial instruments or all financial instruments which need to be scaled up. Uh, here ideas are not necessarily only the new ones, but uh, uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, understanding why they're not working, uh, all the ideas as well. It's not just about financing, per se, it's about funding, having the channels through which private sector can access adaptation opportunities. And here, a big role for regulation. Uh, in the UK, we see in the water system, in the water sector, uh, more broadly, uh, regulation can, can open up uh, uh, opportunities which are not there for private sector at the moment. And then the consideration that the beyond financing, we really need to think about new approaches. Uh, to adaptation resilience. Um, this is about uh, uh, the nexus with nature, climate and nature, uh, is about the use of innovation and technologies, is about systemic approach, which uh, Bernie is going to talk in a minute about, uh, giving an example of the water management sector. Uh, and that is the kind of approach we're using uh, in our research in the future events which are coming up. 
Uh, I put there um, just a few of them, uh, uh, but there is work uh, uh, on adaptation financing we mentioned. There is work on nature investing. We're going to have a webinar in November uh, with our colleagues from the Leonardo Center uh, here in Imperial, and more on that on the last session of today's conference, which I really suggest you should attend. Uh, and we have a conference of the Singapore Broking Finance Center on nature investing at the end of November, just before the COP. This is very rapidly, uh, in a nutshell, uh, um, the, the work in this area. Uh, but we welcome feedback, collaboration, uh, uh, ideas. Uh, so please reach out uh, uh, during the conference uh, uh, to me or, or to my colleagues. With this, I leave it to Bernie. Uh, Bernie, research fellow in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Imperial College. Uh, to talk, uh, uh, give us a brief, brief introduction on his work, uh, his department work, on systems approach for water management in the UK and the implications for financing and adaptation and resilience. Opening up to the discussion here in the panel. Bernie? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Uh, thanks, Rafael. Thanks, um, Emma. I think. Uh, it's really encouraging to hear Emma, someone, <laughs> someone important, talking about uh, some of these uh, concepts, which I think this will be a nice technical illustration of uh, some of the points she's made. Um, and it's, it's based on the research we've been doing in the last five years uh, in the civil group on integrated simulations of water systems, which seems quite detailed. Uh, don't worry, I won't go into too much detail unless you want to, but uh, um, uh, it does have some interesting implications for financing and management. Can I get a slide? Some? Okay, so this is um, uh, kind of two illustrations of what does um, management of water in the UK look like. Um, maybe before you look at these, hopefully everyone in the room has heard of the water cycle. It's a cycle. Everything is connected. That's what a cycle means, right? It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, especially to people who are not in the water industry. As you get more into the water industry, you realize it becomes incredibly uh, siloed. So I illustrate in the, in the top left how we have you know, water supply companies, we have wastewater companies, and we have the environment agency in charge of like, the rivers and the environment and such. Um, the, these three groups of stakeholders all are talking to each other, of course, but their models are not joined up. And I won't give you the evidence, but we have lots of evidence showing that if you don't join up your models that are inherently part of a cycle, it's very difficult to make predictions over what will actually happen because of knock-on impacts throughout the, the water cycle. And I'll give you a couple of examples of what that looks like after this slide. Um, and it's just further reflected in the um, kind of big scale reports that you can see in the bottom right, the things that water companies are, are required to produce and really an enormous amount of money is spent on making all these different reports. And as you can see, each of these reports is also very siloed. So this is the kind of management context that we're in for UK water. But if we go have another slide, you know, this is a very simple example, or hopefully it's simple for me, hopefully it's simple for you, where we have uh, some water upstream, nice clean water in our river, we take some of that water out to store it in our reservoirs, that leaves a bit less in the river. And in some places, that leaves a lot less in the river. Now, if it's one of the days where it's a bit stormy and there's a sewer spill, you've been hearing in the news all these sewer spills, you'll get a certain amount of raw sewage in your river, which is obviously not very desirable. But what you do on your water supply system determines how much water is in your river, and that determines how concentrated the sewage is and how negatively impacting it is on your, on your, on your environment. Um, this is hopefully quite a simple example, but this is coming up everywhere, right? But again, because the water cycle, everything's connected. Our decisions have knock-on impacts um, all, all the time. Um, but we manage water supply separate from wastewater, despite this really inherent connection. Um, and so when we start to, <laughs> how we should be managing and financing our system it is with this joined up thinking in mind. Maybe if we do another slide. Uh, we have a really nice case study where we worked with the Greater London Authority to model the River Lee, um, which is, is one of the kind of big rivers coming into London. And you can see on the left here, you've got the, the Water Framework Directive phosphate classification of all the different catchments. So when you see in the news that says, you know, whatever, two catch, only two catchments in the UK are not failing, 
water quality, they mean that all these maps look like this. Around the UK, it's you know, oranges, reds, and, and, and yellows. It doesn't look great. And you can see particularly the main Lee, which is the red ones down the middle, they're failing on phosphate. Phosphate's a really common pollutant in the UK. It's probably the, the most frequently um, polluting uh, chemical in, in UK rivers. And so rightfully, water companies are being asked to spend a lot of money on improving their treatment plants to make sure they take more phosphate out of the plant. Sounds like a good idea. Phosphate's our biggest issue. We should spend lots of money taking phosphate out of our, out of our sewage. Uh, oh, sorry, back a slide. Um, hundreds of millions of pounds of investment are potentially going to go into these plants that are causing this red color. And we model it in our integrated simulation models. And we find that you go from a failing to a poor, which water companies were a bit surprised about because they're like, well, if we spend hundreds of millions of pounds, we would really expect to be a bit better than a poor. Um, why, why are we still failing on or doing poor, very poorly on phosphate? Uh, and we kind of thought we'd made a mistake in our model. So we go look at our simulations. We go, oh, it's, it's agriculture. 50% of the phosphate in this river comes from agriculture. You're never going to be able to get it above a poor if you only think about wastewater. And that's a perfect illustration why you know, if we have this siloed thinking, thinking, we just cannot fix our problems uh, in the UK. And then one final slide, um, uh, which is just to illustrate as kind of another similar way of uh, thinking about the problem where we implemented um, flood wetlands in a, in a catchment. Um, I'm not going to explain all the results. The error bars are capturing variability over climate change. So you know, we're doing these climate sensitivity analysis. And what we find is wetlands which are designed to um, make flood retention. Of course, they improve the, the, the flooding picture, but they are also improving water quality. They're also improving water supply. Um, even water supply, which you've got on the right there, that doesn't look like much of a difference between those two bars. It's one megalitre per day. But actually, to a water company, one megalitre per day could be costing you know, between one and five million pounds a year. So it can be quite a big impact um, just from a wetland that was designed for a flood scheme but it has these uh, values across the water cycle because everything is connected. And uh, I guess my point is that um, you, should, you should value your, your infrastructure changes um, according to what they are impacting throughout the water cycle, not what they are impacting in, in just the bit you care about. And um, pretty much every single time we look, we find impacts Positive and negative, I've shown you mainly positive impacts, but a lot of the time it can be very frustrating. You feel like you can't fix anything because everything has impacts everywhere. But because every, just because everything has impacts everywhere doesn't mean you should ignore those impacts and you just should value them appropriately and, and work that into your financing. Okay, sorry, I went through that as quick as possible. Hopefully that didn't take too long. That, that it was super interesting <laughs> to me and I think it's a major point about uh, um, the investment proposition here. If the metrics, if the valuation is not the right one, then of course we're not going to take into account the costs of uh, the, the damages uh, of what uh, the stream events uh, uh, are doing. And then uh, it's going to be difficult to incentivize private sector to come in. That is, uh, uh, and, and then from a policy perspective, the lack of systemic thinking, which translates into re regulation of, uh, of what uh, water companies, uh, of course, uh, uh, has major implication about uh, being able to scale up from the private sector side uh, the financing needed. Um, and, and I think yeah. if I may, and I don't want to dwell on this particularly, but uh, that, that is a, another really excellent illustration of where you need the different regulators working together because you've only pulled in the environmental regulator, but you also need to make sure that there is enough alignment with the um, economic regulator as well, which will underpin the investment and, and thinking about financial regulations where relevant. So it gets even more complex. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, bringing in uh, Paul here into the conversation, uh, um, we're going to focus on uh, uh, two aspects. Uh, first is the financing solution per se. Uh, uh, we're talking about new frontiers today. Uh, but as said, I think some of these uh, instruments are not necessarily new, but not applied to the adaptation sector. Is that right? What's, yes. What's your experience? No, absolutely. And thanks very much for the invitation. Um, can, by the way, when I was sat at the back, I couldn't hear very well. So can you hear me? You can. Good. Fantastic. OK, so um, I, I, actually, m many of the things that I was going to say as part of a kind of a contextual piece have been mentioned by Emma, but I think they're really important to, to kind of to, to, to pin on. So first of all, I'll just provide a bit of bit of context, um, a bit about the instruments, and, but also some of the challenges. We need to know the challenges to understand the solutions. 
Um, a bit about kind of some successes um, that we've seen recently in, in the kind of adaptation resilience financing space. And then I'll, I'll kind of leave, leave you with a, a final thought as well. So kind of firstly, you know, Absolutely, in terms of context, we've seen an increase in, you know, in physical risks. You, you, you mentioned we can turn on the news, we've seen wildfires, we've seen flooding, um, uh, we've seen drought in the Rhine, we've seen the Panama Canal having problems again. You know, it's, it's everywhere. And to your point again, Emma, this is at 1.1 degrees or so of, of, of warming. You know, we're not even scratching the surface at this yet. So things, you know, things are going to get worse. And at the same time, um, we are, you know, investing in um, infrastructure assets with very long um, timescales that are going to be here for a long time, even in the UK, that aren't necessarily resilient to that changing climate. And that's going to, that's going to leave us potentially with a, with a big problem on our hands, um, particularly if we don't make the commitments to, um, to stick to, uh, to our uh, emissions reductions. Um, so that's the first part. Um, the second part uh, on instruments, and you mentioned this, Rahil, Absolutely, that those kind of solutions are, you know, are available. We, we can speak to kind of public-private partnerships, PPPs, adaptation resilience bonds. Um, uh, we can talk about um, blended finance, which is often kind of talked about, particularly um, more in the development space as well. Um, infrastructure investment trusts, like like kind of REITs, those sorts of things. They're available. They're just not necessarily being being used, and that's why I wanted to kind of mention this kind of point on what some of the challenges are that people are dealing with, because this is really a, uh, causing a bit of a, a, an issue in terms of kind of scaling the finance that's needed. So when you think about adaptation resilience projects, it's, it, it's very difficult to compare you know, the success, however you define that, of one project versus, versus another. Having those metrics and targets in place which determine how good or how well adapted a project is, is, is seldom, uh, seldom available. Um, so, so kind of for an investor, understanding the return on investment and, and also seeing the un unpredictability sometimes in returns, particularly if you've got a, a, an asset like a hydro asset that's dependent upon, um, upon changes in kind of river flow, for example, that's a, that's a, real, that's a real problem. Um, there's, there's also the kind of this, this wider issue of kind of information asymmetry as well in terms of investors not necessarily having the, the information that allows them to make a decision, you know, the comparability, again, of, of, of projects to allow them to, to kind of make an informed decision. Um, I want to pick up also on a, a point that Emma made around kind of asset versus system level um, benefits as well. It's very easy, or rel relatively easy, to think about asset level interventions. And in many cases, that's where you know, companies are, are quite rightly focused. But we know that these assets operate within a much wider um, landscape of other assets, interconnected with other systems as well and sectors. And that brings with it uh, many more challenges that aren't, aren't quantified. So being able to quantify the benefits of the, the kind of asset level and system level interventions is, is, is a real problem, and, and we're really kind of lacking information in that space. Um, two other points I kind of make on the kind of some of the challenges. Um, there's this kind of sunk cost effect, which is mentioned in the literature quite a lot, and that's essentially saying where um, past investments are given um, a, 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 greater, a greater importance than newer investments, because we've already made the investment, therefore we've got to stick with it. We, we can't cut off that, 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 that investment. Uh, that's, again, a problem for, 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 for investors, trying to understand the benefits of those past, um, those past adaptation and in resilience investments. And then, and then lastly, um, in the kind of adaptation resilience space, in terms of a challenge, many of the projects are relatively small. Uh, and there are, there are many of them, but kind of pulling those together into portfolios that investors can ultimately invest in um, and, and understand, crucially, is also a real challenge um, for adaptation resilience investment. That being said, there have been some successes, and I know um, kind of large institutional investors like JP Morgan, Nuveen, um, Wellington, they already have you know, in place funds that exceed over a billion US dollars um, with kind of dedicated streams on, on kind of adaptation and, and, and resilience. And, you know, to see those sorts of institutions acting in that way is, 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 is fantastic. The other, the other two things I'll mention is um, last year, the Lightsmith Group, they launched their, 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 their dedicated adaptation resilience 
private equity fund, about 186, 180 million US dollars, dedicated solely to adaptation and resilience, um, the, the kind of first of its kind. And then also, um, just earlier this year, back in May, I think it was, um, the, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, they launched their, their very first adaptation and resilience bond, about 500 um, Australian uh, dollars, uh, 500 million, rather than 500 dollars, that'd be very small, wouldn't it? Uh, about 260 um, million, million pounds. Um, so we're starting to see that uh, kind of a, a chain, change in terms of that landscape People becoming investors, becoming more aware of those projects, the risks and the opportunities, but we're still not seeing that, that scale up, and that's possibly due to those challenges. Um, my last point I wanted to make was to kind of leave with a bit of, I guess, a bit of a kind of a takeaway, and it links to a, a point Emma made earlier and that I've, I've already made, but, you know, we say that these kind of targeted investments in adaptation and resilience are needed. They, we always say that adaptation is kind of context and place specific. It matters kind of what the asset is and, and where it is and what you'll, the, the interventions that are needed will be bespoke to the, to the context. But they, they won't necessarily succeed if other, other trends in development are ongoing. So if we're continuing to kind of build in you know, at-risk areas, again, we're going to leave ourselves with, a, with a, a real challenge in terms of further adapting those assets um, further down the line. Uh, can I ask you, you mentioned uh, this uh, private equity funds, uh, Wellington, JP Morgan, uh, your previous point, uh, uh, getting into adaptation uh, financing through different channels uh, or, the, or the bond of the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Do you see the scope for, for this area to become, uh, I mean, there was some figures from impacts as a management in the mission climate ready work, looking at returns for adaptation investments uh, over the last five years, uh, been higher than the, what the market has, has provided in terms of uh, uh, risk and returns. Uh, do you see scope for, 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 for this to become an asset class? Is the same type of um, uh, discussion happening in the nature investing uh, uh, world? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's got to, uh, that, that, I guess that's got to be an ambition. I think that one of the challenges, again, and it, you know, it, it feels, it feels um, a challenge to kind of keep focusing on some of the negatives, but you know, adaptation and resilience affects um, many sectors. Adaptation resilience can come in many forms. It can touch on water, it can touch on, on land use and biodiversity, on nature. And in many cases, kind of classifying adaptation in that sense, um, it can get missed. And we're therefore not kind of capturing those types of, um, those types of investments in, the, in perhaps the right way. But absolutely, if we can agree a classification system, a way of classifying assets, projects, activities, which I know the CBI, for example, has been, has been working on. They've produ they produced a resilience white paper um, earlier this year, I think it was. Um, that's, a, that's a good start. Absolutely. It's featuring in taxonomy work as well, um, both in yeah. Europe and in the UK. So all of this understanding what fits into those classes will, will help. Again, I think this is where those of us whose primary focus might be adaptation and resilience need to work very closely with our colleagues in nature because uh, often, often it is the, nat the natural environment that can produce some of these solutions. So I think we, we need to do kind of everything and be everywhere to, to, to try and make sure that these investments take place uh, because it is also the natural environment that is being damaged through these climate events um, too. So we have to uh, make sure that we're thinking holistically about these subjects. Absolutely. Uh, and just to add to that, I know that, you know, I think it's, the literature is very clear in terms of the, you know, the cost, the positive cost-benefit ratios of, of kind of adaptation resilience invest, investments, and particularly, you know, when you, when you wrap in kind of nature into that. So the, 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 the cost-benefit ratio of kind of, you know, mangroves, for example, restoration and et cetera, reinstatement, are, are, are extremely high, you know, kind of five, five to one in many cases. Early warning systems, nine to one. That, that message is, is quite clear. Um, yeah, we're probably not doing enough to kind of link in those types of um, those types of projects. I think the insurance industry can help. So we spent a lot of time in the early days of uh, looking at the insurance, um, the balance sheets of the insurance companies, and encouraging them to have strong net zero policies. I think there's an even greater. 
or aligned argument for having their investments support this um, type of, of work too. So again, I think that's where we need to focus our attention because whilst you've got schemes that have been set up by organisations like Flood Re, which is a, a pooler working with the um, insurance industry to build back better, we're not getting the money through to the, that next layer of houses, for example, to make sure that they are adapted for the flood when the next bigger flood um, comes, and they're the ones that um, get flooded too, uh, depending on the scale of, the, uh, of the, the flood that's taking place. So getting properties ready in advance as opposed to doing this work after an event is where we've got to get our mindset shifted. And this goes back to what uh, you presented, Barney, on, uh, on, on the systemic approach and the modeling from the engineering side, which effectively is looking at the costs and benefits, uh, not just of the asset, right? Of the project itself, but the chain, the supply chain in terms of uh, uh, management uh, uh, responsibilities uh, uh, and activity. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's in the kind of decision literature, which is where I have a lot of, like, kind of my research background is we almost acknowledge that trying to bring together these very disparate uh, impacts, you know, you can try and do it uh, with, a, with a financial thing and I, with like it just one, you know, money value. But, you know, can we, can we compare, you know, can we put a money value on like salmon spawning and can we put a money value on like, uh, you know, people being able to swim in the rivers? Um, I think uh, acknowledging the the fact that this is inherently multi uh, criteria problem, uh, I think could uh, maybe on your balance sheet you do eventually need to collapse it down into one thing. But at least in working out, working with stakeholders, figuring out what is the appropriate decision that will please everybody, um, uh, usually acknowledging the 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 complexity of the of the decision problem uh, that does tend to help and I think I mean in in, in our uh, uh, the, the report you mentioned we, we talk uh, not just about like net zero from a carbon perspective but you can talk about it from any any criteria you can say net zero pollution you can say net zero um, on your on your abstractions, like so, you have to balance any any increase in abstraction you make. You have to balance with a with a kind of offsetting somewhere, um, and uh, you know there's lots of kind of tools available to you, and uh, uh, it's appropriately <laughs> making making sure that they they kind of factor in and are appropriately valued is is the only way they're ever actually going to get used. And your aim is also to add the biodiversity dimension. Yeah, so I mean, I, I've I've written a paper on it. To, which is just the kind of first link you need to make, which is the link between your chemical water quality and your suitability for different species, um, which we were bewildered that no one had done before. Um, but again, it's this siloed kind of reductionist approach forces people to not necessarily even try these things. So what we did was, was pretty simple. I, I, I mean... For research standards, it was pretty simple, but, but actually showed really promising results. So over the next four years, my goal is to link your biodiversity with your chemical water quality, which we already have infrastructure models to link infrastructures with your chemical water quality, which ultimately, you know, speak to me in four years' time, but hopefully we'll, we'll end up with tools that let you make management infrastructure planning decisions and very directly quantify your, your kind of biodiversity and ecosystem impacts. For me, that's a, a bit of a way off, but um, I hope that it will work. <laughs> I want to inject a little bit of positivity into this discussion because one of the things that I have done in my various roles is visit places after schemes and particularly nature-based schemes have been put in place. And again, this is where I think academia could help in, in terms of what you have created that might be technically a flood storage area. But for the resident might be instead of looking out at a muddy field that floods in anger periodically, you've now got the most stunning wetland 
Uh, you've changed your muddy park into a beautiful place that um, potentially has even impacted your, your house values, the property overlooking this park, those with access to this park, which, yes, will be used when the weather is um, causing floods in anger to hold water, but the rest of the year is very, very different. I've seen these places in London, I've seen them in Salford, I've seen them up and down the country. The, um, the, the, the organisations that have put those, and it tends to be public money, sometimes water companies have been involved as well. It may be a combination of uh, a department, the environment agency, some other local government funding. And they're probably uh, labelled through the nature aspects as opposed to make, being make, made very clear that these are flood storage areas at various times of the year. We need to assess the uplift in, in terms of the, the, the struggle to get those projects to happen. As soon as they're in place, there's a completely different mindset about what they've actually brought. And maybe this is, again, where we need to understand the economic as well as other positive impacts that come with those interventions. And that's just through the flood lens. We need to get cleverer around extreme heat and the way that um, adapting our built environment through Hello, Patrick Rowe from Westminster City Council. Um, I can see how this is really important for government or insurance companies that they're good examples of where putting some finance into these measures is, is going to be beneficial. I'm kind of wondering how you might attract institutional money to this space. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be very keen to, to invest in this as, as a pension fund, potentially. But I just wonder how, what, what that asset class looks like, how you cost that up and, and what the financial benefit is for, for an asset class. I can see credit being really useful. Um, so, you know, helping to finance these measures where it's easily quantifiable, um, the, the megalitres that you use as an example for uh, Barnaby. But, how else might that look in that institutional space? Because that's where there's a lot of capital, so it'd be it'd be good to leverage that to some extent. Who wants to take it? Yeah. Do you want to go first? Do you want to go first? Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I think this is where, again, um, we've got some really interesting early pilots where institutional money has come in at a very, very small scale. Um, I, I can think of a project in the northwest of um, the country where, again, working on a, a nature-based flood solution, there was a way of capturing through a long-term um, product uh, that the services provided by switching this land to a nature-based um, flood alleviation scheme. And ultimately, uh, institutional investors invested in this um, product to front load the work that needed to take place. I think uh, these are the sorts of things that we need to look at what has worked for others, whether it is bringing in the right kind of levy, existing levies, which will create those flows because of the protection that comes about um, through whatever the, the, the service this infrastructure is providing. I think this is, this is where we need to go through um, issue by issue, roll up sleeves and work out what is the best way to create that investable asset class that delivers what is needed um, for the, the, the pension funds. Another idea that was floated um, in New York is in the same way that we hedge against um, foreign exchange fluctuations by pensions funds and sovereign funds putting a small base, numbers of basis points into um, to hedge against those fluctuations. Given what we know about the change in climate, is there something that pension funds need to do to invest in some of these systemic um, 
things that need to happen at a city level, at a country level, uh, that would help protect the returns of their pension funds over the uh, length of time that they will have to prepare... Um, uh, pay out returns to, to beneficiaries. These are the sorts of new frontiers of investment that need to be looked at and urgently to create those flows of money that will be able to invest in uh, creating livable cities, livable countries against all of the climate hazards. I was just to, to add to that as well. I think I think we're you know we're we're. We're all very used to kind of maybe working with and understanding climate data, but for, for many uh, for many kind of investors and other people, other you know, in, in for other financial market participants, that's a, you know that's something that's completely new to them. And I think that, and particularly for kind of you know institutional investors as well, kind of building that institution, institutional capacity, um, the the building that kind of expertise, and in, in order to kind of understand the, the the data, what it's telling you, its limitations, etc., being able to discuss that data um, helps you kind of build a business case also for adaptation resilience. And I think we I think we're still quite away from that. I think we often get very caught in the in the science, in the detail. Um, but uh, and that tends to be constrained within a very small number of kind of institutions, and we're probably a little, little bit of a way off in terms of that maturity curve, in terms of kind of understanding climate data, interpreting it, and being able to kind of speak the language to to investors as well. That's definitely also our impression, and the work we're doing uh, with the centre on the case studies, we've struggled to get uh, uh, case studies on pension funds involvement because of the reasons you just mentioned. Uh, I see there was first another question just at the back. Hello. I'm, uh, my question follows a little bit the comment that you just made. As much as in the um, climate space we understand what GSG accounting is, there is the rise or maybe the justification for a nature-based accounting which would help at least classify the intangible benefits of those investments and make it very, uh, probably more compelling to the financial institution space. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's quite difficult to hear from yeah, me down here. I don't know you, but I, I, I think I... Yeah, I, I would... Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My question was, do you think that similarly to what we're seeing with the GHG emissions accounting principles that... FI financial institutions are adopting that the nature-based accounting system would be a way to unlock that benefit. So you, you don't only measure on your balance sheet the monetary return, but also the nature impact and therefore make the business case and therefore regulations also at the back of that. Thanks. Natural accounting. Yeah, so, so I, th I think um, the, the, the data that will, um, and the disclosure that will come through initiatives like the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosure, which has worked very closely with um, TNFD work, will be really helpful, but it has to go alongside the deals and de the delivery to make things happen. So in, 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 as a further um, answer to the, the, the earlier question and to yours, alongside this focus on data, we also need to make sure there is the technical capacity in um, those organisations that can help build the pilots and the program and the pipeline of investable projects. And I think this is where nature and resilience can come really closely together. Um, I'm, I'm aware of uh, a, an initiative on the back of surface water flooding in London where all of the potential interventions for rain gardens and using nature to hold water is being mapped across London. Alongside of that will be where you've got the um, potential interventions from other utilities to do work. So again, that could bring an efficiency to these, these projects. So once you've got all of that data, I, I can see uh, an opportunity to work with different boroughs across London 
to build this pipeline of projects and then work with the finance community to come up with the best way to try and finance that. And this is where we will need to look at different mechanisms to unlock that finance. But I think it's that uh, understanding that um, we need to build these collaborations to bring the technical ability into those parts of um, government that haven't necessarily got the, or been able to um, resource the expertise that is needed to build that pipeline. This is where we need to work together to um, create these solutions and also work out how the, the, the money flows. So I think Yes, there's no doubt that the accounting side helps, but you've got to look at making real stuff happen because otherwise that data doesn't lead to those projects being implemented. Okay. Local sure. expertise is another major uh, point we didn't uh, uh, raise. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, well, can, can I just chip in on that yes. point? I think, I mean, it's just on this point, uh, like you're right that we need to be agreed upon on how we value things, but I think it's important to acknowledge that, I mean, especially in the biodiversity space, these projects that we implement don't work almost as often as they do work. Um, and so we need to get really much better at following up, monitoring, understanding why these things have or haven't worked. We need to get, in like flood risk, it's very centralized. Everyone knows how do you properly assess your flood risk. But these things are all new. We don't have that many examples of them. We need to centralize the understanding and know-how for how to kind of figure out how to design a good, for example, freshwater remediation project or, or anything. Like I think, because these are much more complicated because they're affecting many more different things. Um, yeah, just wanted to add on that. <laughs> I think we're running out of time, but we just have uh, two last questions uh, we're going to take very quickly uh, to wrap up. Thank you. Um, just to provide, I guess, a bit of an investor perspective. So I work for Red Whale, which is a UK investor focused on public equities or listed equities. And a lot of the conversations in this space tend to be more around private equity or kind of VC opportunities. So I guess maybe two, two points or kind of questions to put. One is whenever I've proposed adaptation as an investment theme, um, to other investors, the reaction has been that it's a very defeatist attitude, that like to adapt is to admit defeat to, to climate transition. So I think there's a bit of a reputational <laughs> challenge here. So I thought, Emma, it was great that you did make the case for why you need it anyway, but interested in any solutions you think we might have for that. And, and maybe more importantly, is just when we're thinking about how do public, how do you access this in a listed equities or indeed, I mean, list, you know, credit as well, but how can you access this theme? How do you contribute to the solution given how much money there is sloshing around in public equity space? How do we use that to target adaptation and resilience? Shall we get also the other question and then uh, give a chance to respond? Hi, um, I work at UNPRI. I'm a senior specialist on adaptation and resilience. So when I'm speaking to inst institutional investors in our network, um, quite similar to the last question and some on the back of um, what Emma mentioned about, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, collaboration, collaboration with public, collaboration with um, organizations like PRI, is there any platforms that you are maybe currently working on that you would recommend is a good opportunity to bring in investors NGOs like PRI, um, research, uh, as well as um, public sector together that we can collaborate uh, on on this topic. So, yeah, maybe I'll speak to the, the kind of first question, then maybe others can pick up the others. But the um, the kind of first point, um, kind of accessing funds, adaptation resilience, kind of where do you where do you start? I think that it, it, it's absolutely the case that you know. Uh, through a lot of these talks, we've been splitting out adaptation resilience and kind of transition risks. They're two sides of the same coin. And a good place to start, therefore, is focusing on, you know, sectors that are both, both at kind of high risk of transition risks, but also kind of ad adaptation kind of impacts and, and, and risks as well. And we can think about the kind of, you know, the kind of power sectors and, 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 and what have you, um, uh, agriculture, et cetera. Um, that's probably a, a, a useful a useful starting point. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to kind of add to that. Does anyone want to add? Well, just quick, quick thing on adaptation that might help is, is you know, 
we have ad adaptive decision making to acknowledge that especially the environment is inherently so uncertain and so variable that why would we expect that we can make the exact right decision right now without any future information? Um, I, the Thames uh, Barrier have done some really nice things. If you search for Thames Barrier Decision Pathways, some really nice work on how do we accommodate adaptation in a, in a formal, structured way that is positive. It lets us you know, make decisions, but it, it does it in a way that, that you know, also helps us prepare for a future that we are incredibly uncertain about what will happen. Um, so just, just to add on adaptation. So on the, on the um, listed equity side, I've looked to the impacts research that was published as part of the Mission Climate Ready um, work. It's on, um, where, where's the link? I think it's on the um, Smith School, Oxford, and yes. the Green, Green Finance it's Institute. Not link than, uh, but but um, impacts has put out the, some, some, it's probably on their website as well in terms of how they've looked at adaptation and resilience as a listed equity um, investment and, and how successful that has been. And I think this is about approaching um, climate change through a slightly different angle. I, uh, I completely understand um, the defeatist attitude around adaptation and resilience. It's not just investors that think this is giving up. It is philanthropy, hasn't funded work in this area. This is just something that has happened to other parts of the world. And I uh, am a global ambassador to the races to zero and resilience, but I put for the um, COP the climate champions, but I focus more on the race to resilience because I can see how this is a whole world issue. And this summer, as we've said, just shows you that this is anybody and everybody and every investment will over time be affected by climate hazards. So I think it's just an argument we continue to have to focus on. And, uh, but I'm also of the view that we can get ahead of it um, by really thinking about how we make our investments and joining these agendas together as you're making a decision to invest. Is this investment going to function in what we know is our, a, a changing climate? And you, you don't need too many scenarios to see which way a particular company may be impacted. Um, either through their supply chain or what it is that they're doing. So uh, I just think it's something that we need to give far greater attention, and I think too, and I think it is a growing reputational risk for boards, for investors, not to be taking into account climate security, and I think that will hit at some stage. What were you doing ignoring this as issue in your portfolios? Maybe, yeah, maybe we need the equivalent of transition plans for adaptation resilience, right? Yeah, definitely. Good idea. Here we go. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panelists.